Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And it is Tuesday, April 27th, and we are going to be looking at H145, an act uh, related to amending the standards of use of force um, for law enforcement. And uh, the bill uh, has come back from, from the Senate. And so the question for us today is whether or not to concur. And we have our uh, legislative counsel, Bryn Hare, with us to explain the um, differences in what passed the House and the Senate. So good afternoon, Bryn. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare for legislative counsel. And um, the so I'm here to talk about the Senate amendment to H145. And it was an instances of amendment. So I thought I could just share my screen so you could take a look at the at what they did. Um, and I'll just start out by saying that they, the Senate only made two changes to the bill. <clears throat> so this should be a pretty straightforward walkthrough. So can everybody see this draft 2.1? Is that clear? Yeah, I see not. Okay. So um, it's, as I mentioned, there's just two instances of amendment. Um, and I'll start out by saying that they that the Senate didn't um, amend section one, which was the law enforcement uh, standards for use of force. They didn't amend anything in that section. So if you remember, the bill primarily um, made a few tweaks to the standards for law enforcement use of force, and it swapped out um, that language about prohibited restraint and the definition of prohibited restraint for chokehold and the new definition of chokehold throughout the standards and also um, the professional misconduct uh, statutes in Title 20. And the Senate amendment doesn't change anything about that, leaves all of that alone. Um, so the, what, the first thing that they changed is, if you remember the justifiable homicide statute was a part of um, H145 because we had to correct some cross-references after you added uh, some language in the standards for use of force. So the justifiable homicide statute appeared in H145, and as the Senate was looking at it, um, I think it was Senator Sears mentioned that subdivision two here, uh, which is not about law enforcement, this is a justifiable homicide statute that just applies generally, um, says that if a person kills or wounds another um, in the forceful or violent suppression of a person who's attempting to commit one of these crimes, murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, burglary or robbery, uh, shall be guiltless. And so the committee engaged in some discussion about um, what that would mean for a person who killed or wounded somebody who is committing a burglary, for example, um, that might not have been a dangerous burglary. So um, they had some conversation about what the um, jury instructions, model Vermont jury instructions look like for um, self-defense. De um, and they decided to add some language here that made it clear that this would this justifiable homicide statute would only apply if the person reasonably believed they were in imminent peril and that it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force. So that's the language that they added here to subdivision two, right here. So although they replaced the whole section four of the justifiable homicide statute, that is the only new language. Um, that's the only difference between how it appeared in the House version of H145 um, and the Senate version, just that. So all these changes that you see in subdivision one, those were the, um, those, were those sort of um, updating amendments that you made in Act 165, and then the changes in subdivision three, which is the part that um, grants immunity to law enforcement who are who kill or wound somebody in um, accordance with the, with the standards for law enforcement use of force. No changes there. So just to that subdivision two. Are there questions about that before I um, move on to the second instance of amendment? Uh, Tom has, a, has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I have a question, and, but I'm not quite sure. Oh, sorry, I just thought. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, in subdivision two, uh, if the person reasonably believed, um, that is that a case by case uh, situation? Because uh, 
and I'm going to ask that's not what a reasonable person would believe, right? Um, so the reasonable, reasonably believed uh, standard is one that you see in the law enforcement um, standards for use of force as well. That reasonable person standard um, yeah. really is judged on a case by case basis, looking at the facts and circumstances of the individual case um, and whether or not it was reasonable for the person to um, use that force in that situation. Oh, okay, so uh, um, so so it's always a case by case. Yes, absolutely. It's not okay because I'm. I mean, I don't know how how I ever thought it would be determined, but I kind of looked at it as an as an average. There's an average in there of some kind no. for uh, um, for a reasonable person, I guess. But okay, no, that's great to know that. Thank you. Yeah, depends on the circumstances. Yep. Uh, Selena. Oh, I, it's always so hard to, um, when it's not a strike all to, I'm just, so I'm trying to understand with this new language, um, because it seems closely tied to the person's um, perception in that moment, and I do appreciate that standard of reasonably believed, but in the in the work on the underlying policy, um, I think one of the important things we've done is include, you know, definitions that essentially require an assessment of the totality of the circumstances. And I'm wondering how you see, like, does this, does this then still require that degree of assessment or? So I'll just emphasize that this does not apply to the law enforcement standards for use of force. This is separate. Um, and and you may have missed when I first started out talking about this. They, yeah, were, they, they were thinking that what the Senate was doing was thinking about scenarios where, um, where a person kills or wounds somebody who's burglarizing their home, for example. Um, but perhaps they did not feel like they were in fear for their life. And so this is sort of separate because the justifiable homicide statute appears in H145, they were kind of taking a look at taking a look at it and how it would apply in other types of cases, just regular um, non-law enforcement cases, just civilian cases of, um, of self-defense. So this language of imminent peril and necessary to repel that peril comes directly from um, the jury instructions, the Vermont jury instructions for uh, self-defense cases. Okay. I'm sorry to, I'm so sorry to make you be redundant on that. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> That's okay. okay. I, don't, I don't see any other hands. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. I think represent. I just saw representative. Oh, sorry. Hand went up, so I'll wait for that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Brian. So you keep saying this doesn't apply to the law enforcement section. So what you're saying is, I don't know how this mirrors this or does not mirror this. If a law enforcement individual reasonably believed that he or she was in imminent peril, that is necessary to repel that peril deadly force, that won't cover them? That won't apply? Well, the, what applies for law enforcement is subdivision three. And you remember, we talked a lot about this justifiable homicide statute in the course of talking about the standards for law enforcement use of force. Mm -hmm. So it's um, for, if you look at subdivision three, in the case of a law enforcement officer, if they used force in compliance with the standards that are created in subsection or in section one of the bill, then they should be found guiltless. Um, so it refers back to those standards that, that um, really describe what, uh, how law enforcement should be using force. So they too are engaged by reasonableness and prudent. Yes. Okay. Yep. It's just a little bit more, um, there's, there's some more guideposts for law enforcement in those standards. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the second instance of amendment and this one's real easy. Um, it just bumps out the effective date for the standards for law enforcement use of force from September to October, um, bumps it out for one more month. And that was at the request of um, DPS. And that is it, they didn't touch anything else. 
Great. Thank you so much, Bryn. Again, I don't see any hands, but if I'm missing any, ah, there you go, Ken. I assume that <clears throat> that was bumped out for one month because of training. Does anybody know? I believe so, but I do see um, Jen Morrison is on, so she can probably maybe answer that better than I can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bryn. Hey, sure. good morning Welcome. or afternoon. I guess we're in now. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, for the record, I'm Jennifer Morrison. I'm the policy director for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, yes, that was the reason for the ask was to allow time for a second draft of policy allow that to be public facing and receive feedback on the se second draft, which of course the second draft can't be written until we have the language from H145 and then a final draft. And then we have to roll the final policy into training curriculum and deliver it to 1200 law enforcement officers. So that extra month, it's very hard to train in the summer on a good year. Uh, and, and with staff shortages at a lot of PDs, I think this is gonna be a very difficult summer to train. So allowing the month of September to actually deliver the training made a lot of sense rather than trying to have to hustle and deliver it during July or August. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Tom. So does that extra month give you enough time then? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I know it's better. Yes, but... <laughs> um, yes. I mean, it, we're being very careful about process equity to allow a lot of public input and stakeholder group input into the policy. And of course, the policy is its own entity that then leads to training curriculum. We do believe that we can do this by October 1st, and we're okay. grateful for the extra month that, uh, that the Senate side inserted so we, we can do it all right great I'm, I'm happy to hear that because if you didn't have enough time that benefits no one so thank you great thank you and anything else you'd like to since we have you or anything else you wanted to add or <laughs> um no we're really appreciative of the process uh we've learned a lot during the process we're we have some great working relationships with other stakeholder groups going. I think we're in a very good place. And I guess I would just repeat what the commissioner said the last time he testified on this, which is we're happy with the language as it left your committee the first time. We have no objection to the Senate side uh, changes in justifiable homicide, and we appreciate the extra month. We would like to drop the placeholder for if in the process of policy development and subsequent training curriculum development and delivery, and then roll out in the field, if we come across obstacles that just can't be sorted out, we would like to be able to come back next session and give you real life examples of ways that we think it could still be further fine tuned and improved. So I guess just dropping a, a placeholder request that this is a work in progress and we would like to feel free to come back and continue our excellent collaboration next session if that is necessary. Absolutely. <laughs> um... Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Tom, I'm going to assume that your hand is up from, from before. Great. Uh, Martin. So uh, first of all, I really appreciate the uh, collaboration that we've had with the uh, Department of Public Safety and appreciate that we will continue that going forward because this is somewhat of an iterative process and I think we're uh, doing the right thing with this. Um, I think the the change makes a lot of sense uh, that they the change that they have on the justifiable homicide really doesn't have anything to do with the police use of force components of the bill. Uh, and we actually did make some changes to make the justifiable homicide provision better, but I think what they have here uh, definitely improves it as well. So uh, I would make a motion that we concur uh, with uh, the Senate proposal of amendment. Thank you. And again, we'll, we'll do this um, by a show of um, hands when we do vote. Um, do I have a second uh, to concur? Second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of concurring with the Senate, show of hands. Okay. All those opposed? Um, Barbara, are you? 
So um, I have mixed feelings now. So I didn't see whether a, a coach uh, opposed or supported. I seconded the motion and oh, I also okay. voted. Thank you. Okay, I didn't see your hand, uh, Coach. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, I wanted to make sure that I didn't do a double. You know. <laughs> okay. So I didn't see any uh, opposition. No. Mm -mm. Right. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So you'll be um, prepared, Martin, to report it. I, I guess we don't have it yet. Um, it should be any day now. I assume it will be on notice tomorrow, but yeah, we'll, we'll see by the other day. Okay. Great. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bryn, and thank you, Jennifer Morrison, and to the commissioner, and thank you. Okay, great. Great. Good work, everybody. And Selena, thank you for uh, uh, for H128. That went well. That was really very moving to hear from the sponsors. So good work, folks. Amazing that uh, now it was unanimous on sides of the virtual building that's pretty incredible yeah it is it really is especially when we see what's going on elsewhere um, okay great so because we are uh tied up on the floor we've rescheduled our um uh, siu witnesses for uh for uh i think uh tomorrow or thursday maybe but they will they will be able to join us so that's that's great um, so now I was hoping that we could vote on S99, which is an act uh, relating to repealing the statute of limitations for civil actions based on childhood physical abuse. Uh, we heard very, very compelling testimony on Friday. Uh, nobody has come forward, nobody else has come forward asking to testify uh, on this bill. So I do think that, that we are ready to vote. Uh, but before we, before I ask for a motion, any, any questions or anything, be, uh, Bob. Well, you just, you just answered my first question, Maxine, was uh, it seems like this is, uh, well, let me back up. It was very compelling, uh, a very gut-wrenching testimony. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, my, my heart goes out to those, those victims. My concern is, it appears as though uh, we may be rushing this somewhat, but you've already stated that no one has come forward to uh, add any additional testimony here. And, and I was concerned about, I realize that the burden of proof still lies within the courtrooms, the civil courtrooms and so on and so forth, as far as if in fact any action is taken. <clears throat> but I guess looking forward, uh, I hope the victims, uh, Get the justification they're looking for, but what can we do, or what do we do to prevent uh, any type of that reaction? Is that, is that something that's preventable? The laws that we pass. I'm sorry, I I, I lost you after. What could we do to prevent? <laughs> um, I don't know if other people heard you, but I didn't hear you. So it, it went it went away for just like about ten words. Right. But it was your Can you hear me now? Yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I'm having audio problems here. I said, I mean, not to repeat everything, but it, it was very gut wrenching, and, and I, I certainly support those individuals 110. percent But my concern was because the bill is moving so quickly. Have we looked at the possibility of of? Uh, and having said that, I know that the burden of proof lies within the court systems here. But in the bill itself, uh, is there anything that needs to be addressed as far as preventing? Uh, writers or, or copycat individuals, uh, I guess that won't really apply to the bills that we, we, we address and, and push out of committee. Or did I'm, I I'm not sure I understand your question, but, but this bill only pertained to the statute of limitations and eliminating it. Yep. Uh, On physical abuse, correct? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ken. Hi, can I, I'll go right after Tom here, please. Thank you. Okay. Tom. Yeah, uh, yeah Maxine, uh, being such a short bell, can we just get a quick run through from Eric? Um, sure, is that, Eric, are you able to, to do that? 
Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is the bill that uh, repeals the statute of limitations for uh, actions based on childhood physical abuse. So remember, there's, a, there's a, already a statute on the books that you passed two years ago that repealed the statute of limitations for uh, actions based on childhood sexual abuse. So the two, two types of abuse are defined differently. In the, uh, right now, for, for physical abuse, uh, the statute of limitations is three years. That means if you don't file your lawsuit within three years, um, you're not able to file it at all, barring some kind of fraud or some other kind of extenuating circumstance. Now that, that statute of limitations starts ticking uh, when someone reaches the age of majority. So in other words, it doesn't start while someone is still a minor. So the way that's been interpreted, the three-year clock begins at eight, when someone turns age 18, which means, generally speaking, that someone would have until they turn 21 to file uh, an action for damages based on physical abuse that happened when the person was a child. So as a re what uh, the bill proposes to do is the same way that it did with <clears throat> in the sexual abuse situation is to repeal that statute of limitations so that the person who suffered abuse as a child wouldn't have that three year limitation anymore and would be able to bring uh, an action in court to recover uh, for the harm and that they suffered at any time in the future. Uh, that that uh, new provision is also retroactive in the bill, also the same as the way uh, the legislature had done it with respect to sexual abuse, which means that it doesn't apply just from now going forward. It's retroactive. So if someone had suffered abuse, you know, pick a date prior to now, 1960, 1970, 1980, whatever it may be, some, some uh, date upon which um, the, the statute of the three-year statute of limitations period would ordinarily have run as a result of this bill, that limitations period is repealed and the person could bring suit at any time they were ready to do so. Uh, the last point in the bill is that um, there's also a higher standard of proof established for these retroactive actions uh, if, the, if the defendant is an institution. So in other words, if the defendant is an individual person and, you're, and the person is being sued for abuse, it's just the regular standard of, of proof, uh, lack of reasonable care, negligence, that would apply in any lawsuit for damages. But if the uh, defendant is an institutional defendant, for example, an employer of the person who committed the abuse, in that case, uh, it's a higher threshold. It's a higher burden of proof. Uh, the, the, if it's a retroactive action, in other words, an action that happened 1960, 1970, whatever, some action that would have been barred by the statute of limitations uh, otherwise, then you have to, the plaintiff would have to prove gross negligence. So not just a lack of reasonable care, but a failure to show any care at all, any care whatsoever. Uh, so that was sort of the compromise that was reached within the, in the sexual abuse situation. In other words, you know, there was a, a debate about whether or not these retroactive statute of limitations should be enacted at all uh, to revive lawsuits that have otherwise expired, right? Because this, this, the, what this does is it, it's called a revival. It, it's the term that's used in the law. Uh, a reviver, and it revives actions that otherwise have been banned by the statute of limitations. And so the compromise that was reached was, okay, if the, in an institutional defendant situation, we'll revive the action, but we're going to make the threshold of proof higher. And that's why it's gross negligence um, here, as well as in the sexual abuse statute. Um, so that may have been a little, little lengthier than you wanted, but <laughs> I think that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Sure. Uh, so, Ken, are you ready now? And then Barbara? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Eric just helped me out quite a bit, but I still, um, I obviously, I want to take care of the victims. I'm extremely worried about copycats and, and, Maybe what he just said helped me a, a little bit with that, but why does this have to be pushed? Why can't we just wait? I think we're going to get a lot of pushback if we don't wait a little bit to see if somebody else comes comes up to uh, 
to testify and show us a, a, another side of this? Why does this have to be done now? Uh, Felicia, did you? I saw your hand go right up. Yeah, and this is committee discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not sure I have all your answers, Ken, but to reframe it, why should we make anyone wait any longer to hold an abuser accountable? I mean, it's, it's, it's always hard to look at a substantial policy and see it moving quickly and not think that we have time to hear from both sides because hearing is important. But with something as, as fundamentally important as this is holding somebody accountable for damage to their childhoods, to, to, to future children, to show that we are doing something here, why are we making them wait? I mean, we had testimony that the average person coming forward is 51 years old. I mean, those are not children. That's not somebody who's just out there looking for attention because they want to get a start in life. I mean, if, if you reframe the perspective a bit on your question, why should we make them wait any longer? I think that that, for me at least, fully justifies the speed of this bill, along with the fact that we've asked for opposition and we found none. And there's not a compelling reason to continue to protect those out there that we know are abusers that would fall under this law. So I don't have all the answers to your questions, but that as, as a committee member, I could not say that, so. I Thank you, Felicia. Yeah, and I, um, yeah, and I think Felicia um, summarized it very well. There was not any opposition in the Senate. Um, this bill is, you know, Senate 99. I don't know exactly when it was introduced, but the Senate Judiciary Committee um, took quite a bit of testimony. I believe they had a, uh, a joint hearing uh, on it. And, um, and we had, you know, put it, it's been on our um, agenda since Friday. Um, this is similar to what happened last time we did. Um, we did statute of limitations. It's, it's, it's not unusual uh, not to have opposition and other bills that we've done before as well. Um, there, you know, there have been times where there hasn't been opposition. But um, Felicia, did you wanna add something before I? Okay, great. So then uh, Barbara and Martin. Um, Felicia, that was really inspiring. And I have been haunted since Friday again, like, and it's interesting because I was talking to a constituent and their grandfather was at the orphanage. Um, I just learned that over the weekend. Um, so yeah, there are so many people that are affected. So Eric, I have a question for you and you may have said it when you were just after I raised my hand, but my phone rang and it was so I didn't fully hear you. So I was under the impression from when we went through the bill last week that you were saying if the um, person who um, experienced abuse was suing an organization, they had to show a higher standard of proof. But now when you were saying it, I was getting the impression that you were saying, if an organization is suing the employee. So I'm a little, I'm just wondering which of those two things this bill is addressing. Like, are they, saying, yeah, okay. It, it's the first one. No, I, I, did, I wasn't referring at all to the organization. Okay. So maybe I misspoke if I did, sorry about that. Um, no, it's only about the, the standard of proof, the burden of proof uh, on the victim suing an organization. Why, why is it higher? against an organization? As I say, that was the, the result of a compromise two years ago. And it was because, you know, there are uh, longstanding policies for having statutes of limitations at all. And to revive, a, revive a, an action that has been foreclosed by the statute of limitations 
it is a big step and and uh, it's not something that's done all the time and in fact it's it's uh, only recently has it been done a lot in particular because of uh, all the allegations of childhood sexual abuse that have, have come to light in recent years so i think that the uh, organizations uh, there's also uh, i know it's um, i won't be able to repeat the arguments verbatim, but insurance companies were concerned about uh, their ability to provide insurance uh, and, and even, cost, yeah. even, yes, and that the entities themselves yeah, yeah. were concerned about their ability to afford insurance because the prices would be so high if they were sure. subject to endless liability. You know, those calculations for policy costs are based upon, as, as you well know, um, what <laughs> those things. So I think those were where some of the some of the debates were uh, last time, and uh, and so where they landed was, you know, um, will permit the the revival of suits even against institutional defendants, uh, but narrow it somewhat by having that higher higher evidentiary burden. Um. So Eric, sorry, gosh, like it's amazing how much our phones ring. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so what I'm wondering is this, let's say you're an organist, uh, you know, and I love the sector, but let's say you're a nonprofit organization and you see these coming, you're going to start getting rid of your old records if you have no reason to keep them. Like, I, I just feel like we might have, um, because there's no, for certain clients, there's no, um, not there's no sort of standard of how long you keep certain records you have to keep forever but not other types of of human services and so i'm wondering i'm just wondering about that like is I think it that this, one, yeah. this, this this bill certainly would not immunize a defendant from a separate fraud claim if if now from some time from now in the future they engaged in the destruction of evidence or or anything else that would subject them to a whole other layer of liability um, but not before a lawsuit though right like it's only once you know you're going to be sued that you can't get rid of stuff uh in connection with the suit i don't know that that would necessarily mean they couldn't be liable for anything i mean the the, the uh destruction of documents might support some sort of independent claim and even if they hadn't actually been made a defendant in a suit. I think it might be reasonable to conclude that if you know, as soon as this law passed, an entity started destroying documents, you might argue that it was because they were anticipating, even if they hadn't been actually served with papers yet, <laughs> that that was the reason they were doing it. But again, you might. See, I know one of the big things is making sure you're following your policy. So if I were. I might say, oh, we just came up with our policy and we don't keep records more than 10 years. But I'm wondering, like, and I don't know if this is a question for, but I'm just wondering, like, how would you see um, evidence playing out in court for an organization versus if we're gonna sue, like, could somebody could go find that house mother if she's still alive and sue her as well right or no, they're just going to sue the organization. They're, they're not limited to their defendant. They could okay. look for the individual or, or, um, an, or and, and or the institutional defendant. Yep. So there, there's going to be a lower level of proof for the house mother. Correct. And so can you just remind me again what the um, burden of proof is in each for each of those two categories? For the individual, it's uh, negligence, which is a lack of reasonable care under the circumstances. Um, okay. So you have not exercised what would be a reasonable level of care that would be expected of somebody in similar circumstances. For an institution, it would be gross negligence, which would be you've exercised no care at all. You fail to exercise any care. So if they exercise the teeniest bit of care, and I don't know if you heard the witnesses, like if they're like, hey, we gave everybody a brochure saying not to have sex with their client or like, would that, 
get them off the hook? I don't think so. That's not the way it works. I don't think that uh, a jury would see it that way. I mean, that's a jury question. That's not something I can give you an answer okay. on as to how one would see that in those circumstances. But those are fact questions for the jury and they weigh all the circumstances uh, that have come into play. And I think, you know, a jury that weighs uh, facts that involve, you know, repeated instances of abuse, reports of abuse, attempts to reports of abuse, as we heard, uh, you know, uh, the in institution telling the victims not to report it, all, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, having, then being able to, you know, try and make a claim that they exercise some scintilla of care is certainly not going to automatically immunize somebody from liability. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Martin, then Coach and Tom. So, I have a lot of thoughts about this particular bill. Um, and I'll, I'll just start by saying that I think it's very important that we open the court doors for these past abuses, uh, mainly to allow uh, individuals who have gone through this uh, to have some sense of closure as well and feel that they can be heard. Um, yeah, I, I have, uh, I actually, sat in on a session uh, with the St. Joe's, uh, the, the group, uh, I think it was in December, maybe it was January, I earlier this year. And, and I explained to them, I, I, I felt that this isn't a bill that's, that's critical for going forward and preventing future child abuse. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily the deterrence. Uh, other places are where we should be focusing for that. Having said that, again, I absolutely support the bill because it does provide uh, past victims uh, with uh, some uh, sense of closure. And, and it may have some, though, I just don't think huge deterrence value. But it's not going to be easy for an individual to make out these claims. And I think that that's probably the way it, in fact, should be. Because again, statutes of limitation are there because memories fade or change, uh, evidence uh, goes away. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's why statute of limitations are there. And so when you're opening up a statute of limitation, uh, you don't want it, in my view, to be uh, really, you know, super easy to make a claim. And, and, and by no stretch of the imagination is this easy. And, and, and maybe this goes to Ken's concern as far as, this, you know, are, are people uh, try bringing claims that really are not supportable. Uh, First of all, they, they would have the burden of proof. The plaintiff would have the burden of proof, and it will be difficult to prove something that happened 40, 50 years ago. It's, it's just, you know, they, they will be able to testify, but, but they, they have to bear the burden, and it's not going to be easy. I will also note that uh, this is not just for any kind of an assault. This is not for spanking. This is not for anything like this. Uh, this is for... Uh, physical abuse that would amount or that would be prohibited by uh, aggravated, the aggravated assault statute uh, is, and, and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but the aggravated assault statute uh, requires, it's a, an attempt to cause serious bodily injury uh, to another or, or causes such injury, injury purposely, knowingly, or recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. From some of the stories we heard last week, you know, my view, if I was on the jury, if, if they're able to prove that up, they probably have met that standard. But the point is that that is a high standard. Uh, that is a high standard of, of, of uh, not high standard of proof, but, but a high standard of uh, actual behavior that they would have to prove. Uh, so so I, I think that these are high hurdles, but I, the court door is open through this particular statute. Uh, it does allow some closure for these individuals. It does allow them to make their case, but it's going to be hard to be. It's going to be hard to to make their case. So, uh, so I'm in support of the the bill uh, as it is right now. And then I do also think uh, it should be a little bit more difficult, as as Eric has already gone over the why we have statutes of limitation as far as uh, suing the organization as well. So, so I do support though. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Coach and then Tom.
Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, there are some very significant points that were made uh, in explanation. Um, you know, Martin and Barbara uh, and uh, Felicia. Um, to uh, Ken's point about time, uh, I just went back and looked at the uh, record, the bill's record, uh, because you can you can track a bill at any given point in time. And the bill uh, was initiated in February. Um, it hit committee early uh, in April, and it went through the whole Senate process over a period of about um, uh, two and a half to three weeks. And when you think about uh, as visible uh, a bill as this particular one is, not that they all aren't, but um, the, the level of um, emotion uh, as well as, uh, um, you know, just, um, you just got muted, uh, uh, coach. You need to unmute yourself again. Yep. Sorry about that. You know, you, you always have to move the cursor far away from the mic because it will do that to you. <laughs> but, um, you know, what I found interesting was it was in Senate discussion for a pretty good period of time. So I would think um, with that amount of visibility that, you know, if there were other uh, individuals that, you know, were going to come forward, um, you know, they would have, um, or groups, uh, because it seemed that uh, uh, the survivors group that, that we heard from, um, you know, clearly, um, you know, it, it took a while for them to get to that point where they could. And then, um, it, you know, like Bob was saying, it, it was tough, you know, listening, you know, to that, listening to that testimony. Um, so I, I would hope that, you know, anyone that uh, felt that they needed to have reached out uh, to either body, you know, you know, would have, you know, with the amount of time that this has been, you know, let's say open to discussion. Uh, just wanted to, to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you, coach. Appreciate that. Uh, Tom, oh, actually, your hand just went down, Tom. So I don't... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being oh. a proactive. There you so, go. So Will right. wouldn't give me grief. <laughs> no, um, Actually, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask Eric Martin answered, and, and uh, I kind of knew the answer anyway, about the higher standard with the aggravated um, uh, uh, definition on it. But uh, uh, now I got to go back to the bill. So in the... Uh, okay, actions based on... Uh, it includes that, but it's, it's beyond that. If you look... In, this, in the language of the bill, see, sexual abuse uh, is also defined and that identifies several sex offenses that would meet the stat definition and statute. So yes, that's one of them, but there's a few others as well. Right, right. And uh, again, what, what Martin was saying, it's a, it's, it's a higher, higher standard to prove the way I understand it, and uh, which I, I think would make it difficult for people to come forward with, with false claims, but, um, and coach, um, was, I was going to be lazy and ask Eric with the, <laughs> what the timelines were, uh, you know, and what happened in the Senate and, and, uh, coach did his homework and, and, uh, and, uh, and did it. But, uh, so anyway, I went to the, uh, to the bill page and to see what the Senate did on it, and there's, let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, on the bill page, the, uh, the last one being us the other day, which is an incredible amount of, amount of work that's been done on this bill. Um, 
And yeah, uh, uh, we haven't spent a lot of time on it. Um, uh, um, but this, it's, um, it's a, it's, it's a very simple bill, I guess, as far as the changes go, but I mean, it's certainly not a simple bill. It's an important bill things on it. Gosh, anybody who's in opposition, they've had, um, you know, like Maxine had Evan do to, you know, to come in and, and with the work the Senate's done and, and what we've looked at, I, I don't, I really don't consider it wrong. So, um, I, I'll certainly be supporting it. Uh, not seeing, uh, <laughs> Selena, there you go. I was just going to say, if you're looking at its work on this bill. I'll second. Great. Thank, thank you so much. That is where I was going. So again, um, we have a, um, a first and a second. Um, any committee? Okay. Not seeing any. Um, so, so Ken, I would like to do a, a roll call on, on this, please. And, and you have your hand up. I think you know the answer to that question. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't even trying to be funny. Okay. I want to make sure that I'm doing because I thought that the Senate just passed this right through to us. I didn't realize all this is being done. And while everybody's talking, I'm trying to go back through here. I want to take care of the victims. I made that perfectly clear. I just want to make sure in my mind that I've covered all my uh, bases. But we can vote now if you want. Um, yes. Yeah, so if the clerk uh, can uh, can commence to call the roll, please. Colburn. Yes. Donnelly. Yes. Can I come back to me while I'm doing this? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Lalon? Yes. Leffler? Yes. North? I didn't, I didn't hear. Morris? Yes. Yes. Rachelson? <clears throat> yes. Christy? Yes. Tom? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Felicia, are you, are you still interested in reporting? I am, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, so because we're concurring, um, you know, it won't be on our the actual language of the bill won't be on our calendar. So um, I mean, I'm sure you know this, right? Um, just referring the, the body to where they can find the language would be helpful when recording it. So, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, can I see your, is your hand still up from before? Or are you you're good? Okay. Okay. All right. So we are going to uh, pivot again and go back to S3. Folks need a minute to, yeah. Okay. So why don't we just take a minute so folks can uh, find what they, um, find the version of uh, S3 as well as I believe um, under Eric for today, we have some proposed Language, is that correct? Um, where's that? No. Yes, that's right. There's a there's a proposed language on section one. I believe that's although in fact that language, if I remember correctly, sorry, Evan posted that under Representative Lalonde's name. Yeah. So uh, that's where that's posted. Yeah, the proposed language is under. Um, Rep Lalonde's name, um, since he was the lead sponsor on it, the well, lead person proposing and dealing with the language. Okay, so we're still working on draft um, 4.1 in terms of looking at the whole document is correct. And then 
and then the language um, proposed language will be I can kind of look at it side by side but I think in terms of if you want to look at just this section which is where the only change is between this draft and the previous one mm -hmm. you only need to look at the document under Representative Lalonde's name you don't need to open anything up right else up just look at that document okay great thank you yeah Okay, so I'll, I'll have Eric um, explain this language, but committee, if you remember, uh, we were going, we spent quite a bit of time talking about this section and uh, in the interim, uh, Martin has been working with uh, all the stakeholders on, on language um, and has received quite a bit of, of feedback, um, which is what this is a result of. So. Eric, if you can um, let us know what this does, um, and at the same time, you know, maybe sort of going back a little bit and reminding us about this about this section of the of the bill. Thank you. So we're, we're looking at section one under Martin's name. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, as the chair mentioned, that uh, this section has has been the subject of quite a bit of discussion both in the community, I'm sorry, in the community, <laughs> in the committee, <laughs> perhaps in the community as well, <laughs> but I'm not privy to that. <laughs> the, uh, in the committee and uh, as well as with a number of other stakeholders who've gone back and forth on it, uh, trying to, trying to uh, amend and massage the language. But the subject is, you remember section one has to do with the initial uh, psychiatric report that the court orders when a defendant's sanity or competency to stand trial uh, is raised as an issue in a case. So uh, when that happens, the court has to order the psychiatric report and um, it's a neutral evaluation. And the committee has talked quite a bit about some of the background principles on that. For example, that uh, insanity at the time of the offense is a different thing than competency to, competency to stand trial. So there are two different topics that the psychiatrist could be analyzing. And as well, another point to keep in mind, because this will all help us understand what the proposed language is doing, I recall that uh, a person could be uh, found incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the offense on the basis of, for example, a mental illness, right? And that's the term that the statute uses anyway. And if that were the case and the person was then found dangerous, the person would be committed to the Department of Mental Health. But it, it also could be that a person could be incompetent to stand trial or insane in connection with an offense on the basis of a developmental disability, right? Doesn't not, not a mental illness, but a developmental disability. And in that case, uh, if the person were found dangerous, they would be committed to Dale for purposes of custody. So you have those two possible tracks. Uh, and that's important also because I'm gonna pull up one statute also just for background here. Um, although maybe I don't need to pull that one up. I'll, I'll get to it if we need to, but, but there is a statutory requirement that if um, a person's uh, a person who's been uh, had their competency or sanity raised in connection with the criminal proceeding, if it's uh, if it's thought that they may have a developmental disability, right, as opposed to the to the mental illness, then the and actually I am going to pull it up because it's important to look at the language now that I think of it. Uh, but I'll keep talking while I do. Um, the uh, uh, okay, All right then the examination that I'm talking about uh, has to be, has to include uh, not just the examination by a psychiatrist, uh, and that's the important part of the language that we'll see in a moment, uh, but also um, you'll see right here, it's the language is very simple. It's one sentence and it's right in the same chapter of law that we're working at, that working with. It's not just a couple of sections away in 4816B, right in the middle of the page there. So the competency evaluation for an individual thought to have a developmental disability shall include a current evaluation by a psychologist skilled in assessing individuals with developmental disabilities. So the phrasing of that language, you'll see shall include. So it's by implication there that 
that um, it's not instead of the evaluation by a psychiatrist, it's in addition to. That's what that language certainly appears to say. Shall include. It doesn't say uh, you know, that it shall be done by a psychologist uh, skilled in assessing individuals with developmental disabilities instead of the psychiatrist. It says that says the evaluation has to include that. So with that as background, uh, we're going to turn for a moment. And this is one of those situations where because of the importance of the uh, wording, I'm just going to pull up the amendment for uh, a brief moment. And this is it right here. Uh, so this is the section that I was talking about, section one, this, this initial evaluation when a person's competency or sanity has been raised. Um, so you'll see that there was some back and forth about how it was uh, most accurate to phrase this language. And it's it happens a couple of times. But the language is to make the point that this evaluation is going to be, remember, so now having looked at that statute, you can probably understand that this evaluation is going to be either by a psychiatrist, if it's a mental illness situation, or if it's a developmental disability situation, it's going to have to be by a psychiatrist and a psychologist, right? Based on that statute we just looked at. So getting that phrasing exactly right was something that folks were going back and forth on. Should it be and? Should it be or? Um, you know, uh, how do we make it clear? And that's why you'll see there's a specific cross-reference now to the language we just looked at so that people are clear. These were all suggestions that were made by, by um, uh, the Defender General and Representative Donahue and, and uh, 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 Vermont Legal Aid, other folks who were in involved in this sort of uh, shopping back and forth with myself and Representative Lalonde. So we made suggestions as well. So ultimately, though, I think language was settled on that everyone agreed to, which is what you're looking at right here in the third line down in the yellow highlights, making clear that this first, this first examination uh, um, is gonna be conducted by the examining psychiatrist or if applicable under section 4816B, that's what we just looked at, the psychiatrist and the psychologist, see? So there are two possibilities, it's either done by the psychiatrist or if that statute applies, then it's the psychiatrist and the psychologist. So that uh, is something you'll see a couple of more times as we look at this new language, but that's the reason for that change. Um, so now we get to the other the other major point that was going on in this uh, section, which I'm sure folks remember, which is the idea that what about, uh, remember, since competency and sanity are two different things, uh, generally speaking, they should be, and that's the first sentence you'll see here, I just clarify the first highlighted phrase is really just a, a language change for clarity. Um, but this is pointing out that, well, if the court orders the examination of both competency and sanity, then those opinions are presented in separate reports, reports and addressed separately. That's consistent with this whole idea that uh, the two things are different uh, and need to be addressed in separate reports because they're uh, different concepts and involve uh, different, different uh, points. So that clarifies that in the first sentence. So again, this whole idea of this subdivision is all about this idea, this uh, um, situation, but when there may be uh, an examination of both competency and sanity. So the first sentence says, okay, if there's going to be examination of both, they have to be separate reports done on each one. Second sentence goes on to say, uh, remember, this is the point that folks were talking about, the committee has been talking about a lot is, uh, well, what's going to be the sequence of these two reports? The first sentence says, okay, they have to be separate. But uh, remember, and then this is the issue that the committee's talked about of, well, since a person uh, is not going to be raising a sanity defense uh, if they never are found competent, right? If they're, because a person can be um, uh, treated for competency and they may regain competency at some time in the future. They may not. Uh, if they never do, then there will never be any reason uh, that the person would raise a, an insanity defense. And so there would not be any reason to conduct uh, an examination, an evaluation by a psychiatrist of the person's sanity, because it would never come up unless at some point in time they uh, regain competence. So uh, what that second sentence then makes clear is that the examination of the person's sanity shall only be undertaken, and this is now the first line of the next page right here at the top, that examination shall only be undertaken if the psychiatrist, and again, you see that phrase that I just said again, this is clarifying the psychiatrist uh, and psychologist point. So. Um, again, so that examination is only undertaken if that psychiatrist 
or if 4816, 4816 applies the psychiatrist and the psychologist, if they are able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial. So that's the point, the first point that I was just talking about. That examination of sanity doesn't happen until uh, the person is determined to be competent because sanity would, wouldn't be raised unless they were found competent uh, in the first place. So that's that first point. Then highlighted is the second phrase. Again, so generally that uh, principle that I just laid out applies generally. The um, the competency, uh, sorry, sanity evaluation isn't done until competency is found, unless, see, that's a highlighted language, third line down starts at the end of the line, unless the defendant requests that the examinations occur concurrently. So remember, that's the other concept that the committee had been talking about. Shouldn't, should the defendant have the ability, uh, if they so choose, to request that the examinations occur at the same time? And I think that's kind of the direction the committee was moving in. That was the uh, the uh, American Bar Association's proposed language. That's what this is based on, that that, that principle that the defendant should have the option uh, to have the examinations occur at the same time if they so choose, uh, even though if they don't, then, then as we see here, the fallback, if they don't so make that choice, is that they're done separately. Um, so that language provides the defendant with that option to choose. Um, and then it goes on in the next paragraph to say, uh, then if the, if the uh, and this is the point that, that the committee had also spent some time talking about as well, if there is that separation in time, right? If, the, if let's say the defendant doesn't choose to uh, have the examinations occur concurrently and instead uh, the sanity examination doesn't occur until some years in the future, then it raises that concern that the committee's talked about of, loss of evidence, of uh, people's memories fading, of you know, this potential that there could be problems with conducting that evaluation 5, 10, 15 years after the offense. So this second sentence here has to do with that situation and uh, providing a way for uh, some of the uh, uh, background, even if, even if the evaluation of the defendant personally doesn't occur at that time contemporane contemporaneously, there's still the ability, uh, and in fact, the requirement that the um, evaluator take reasonable steps to preserve other evidence. So you'll see that's what the language makes clear. So if the evaluation of the defendant's sanity, and I'm reading the highlighted language that from the middle of the page on down, if the evaluation of the defendant's sanity at the time of the offense, the alleged offense does not occur until the defendant is deemed competent. So in other words, you know that, that first sanity um, Evaluation doesn't happen until later on, some years, however it is down, however much time down the road that the defendant ret retains competency. Uh, if that happens, then the psychiatrist, or if applicable under so and so, the psychiatrist, as we just went through, and the psychologist, shall make a reasonable effort to collect and preserve ev any evidence necessary to form an opinion as to sanity if the person regains competence. Um, and the make a reasonable effort language is new. Uh, added a, out of a concern that if you were making it mandatory, if it was says shall collect and preserve any evidence necessary, sort of raises the question of, you know, well, what, what would be the consequences of failure to preserve the evidence? If they didn't collect and preserve, and if the statute said they shall, what does that mean then? Does that mean there's, there's a, a defense that the person could raise and the, the person might be able to, uh, uh, you know, evade the prosecution completely, raise a complete defense? Uh, would it mean that there would be some ability to sue the psychiatrist or psychologist who didn't conduct the examination? Just raise questions to phrase it that way. So uh, it's common to, in various circumstances, to require reasonable efforts. And so that's what the change was here, to say that it, it, there is a requirement that they take some action, but the action is that they make a reasonable effort um, to collect and preserve the evidence so that they, to form that opinion um, later on down the road when the sanity issue uh, comes back. So that's uh, that's the proposal, as I say. It's been batted around by a lot of people, and I think uh, there was some consensus, but I'll let uh, Representative Vallon talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I can pull down the screen now, Chair Grad, unless you want to keep looking at it. Uh, yeah, why don't you pull it down um, for now, please, because I want to see if sure. any members have any have any questions for, for you. So any any questions on the um, 
on the drafting. And I, I will say there was quite a bit of <laughs> um, conversation and back and forth. And um, let's see, I know there were at all times 12 people on the email um, chain and that included, I think myself and Evan. So <laughs> at least, um, and I guess Eric, but a number of stakeholders, I think all of the stakeholders were, were involved in this, so. Um, oh, can I just jump in real quick before uh, you get to Tom, just on that one issue that you yeah. just mentioned. Uh, I, under my name is, is the email thread, so everybody can actually see all the emails that went back and forth on this latest draft. There was probably something similar last week when it just didn't work out. Uh, but uh, Matt Valerio of the Defender General's Office and A.J. Rubin of the Disability Rights Vermont, Judge Brian Grierson, Representative Van Pugh, uh, John or Jack McCullough of Vermont Legal Aid, uh, and uh, let's see, I'm looking who else, uh, Dr. Raven of the Vermont Medical Society, Will DeWhite of uh, Mad Freedom, and David Shear of the Attorney General's Office. All of them eventually all landed on this language that was presented, and, and all that all that string is is on there for transparency reasons. It's it's under my name, so people can follow that dialogue uh, themselves. Thanks, Martin. You said um, Representative Ann Pugh. Did you did you mean Ann Donahue or? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say Ann Pugh? Yeah. Ann so, Pugh was not part of this. It was yeah. Representative Ann Donahue. I apologize uh, for that slip. Right. Uh, yeah. So so all all those uh, interests were weighing in on this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This is, this is confusing to me. Um, sometimes things just aren't that easy to understand, I guess. But so, so Maxine, we, uh, there was several of us that got uh, that email from Kelly Carroll and you had responded to her. So I, I guess my question is, is how does this pertain to her uh, uh, concerns. I, I know that she she was kind of mistaken in her, her in her her letter that it had been ch things had been changed already. Um, but I guess you know, judging from what she put in her letter and in this new language, um, I mean, I I know you can't speak for her, but um, I, I guess uh, how did, how would this uh, address her concerns? I guess. Right, well, I need to go back unless, um, Eric, if, if you can help here, because uh, I would need a moment to look and see. Um, I'm not sure that this was part of her concern. Okay. But Eric can. I don't, th I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't, oh, think, okay. I don't think this is one of the points she identified. Yeah, right. thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. But uh, it, it is confusing. Uh, this, this whole bill is really, um, I wouldn't say absolutely new, but it's, it's something that we don't do as much as some of the other things that we, that we do repeatedly as a committee. And, and so, um, so it is confusing and we'll keep having Eric help us understand it. Uh, this was the one, uh, one piece that there was a lot of discussion on back and forth with the witnesses. Uh, but it does seem like it, everybody, you know, has landed, uh, in a, uh, in agreement. On yeah. This. Well, when you have that many people <laughs> involved, that's, that's, uh, that's some good work. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Thank you. Um, okay. So, and again, I'm not for a straw poll. I'm not asking for anything. This is, this is you know, a proposal that we're gonna continue to look at, but that was an outstanding issue. Um, another issue that uh, actually um, uh, Ms. Carroll did address uh, is on, well, I'm looking at 4.1 page six and the language that is suggested for which the person has been charged and, um, Eric, is this, is this something that you can, can speak to? My understanding is that this language came from Representative Donahue, and there was question as to whether or not 
um, whether or not this language is, is necessary. And I had, I don't think we had heard any objections from the witnesses about this language. It's been in here for, for quite a while. 4.1 page six, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Maxine, can I ask a specific question about that language, which I think gets to, to the, sure. the, the issue that uh, that Ms. Carroll had with it? And, mm -hmm. and that is, I, I guess the, the question I would have is, what would happen in a situation, Eric, uh, if the charges are dismissed, uh, if the person's deemed to not be competent to stand trial, and for some reason, you know, the, the prosecutor does have the uh, discretion and, and does often well, I don't know often, but Cannon does uh, uh, dismiss the charges. Uh, does this language for which the person has been charged, does that uh, make it so it no longer applies to the situation if the charge has been dismissed? Does that question make sense? Uh, I think so, but I wouldn't read it that way. I think the person has been charged, even if even if subsequently they were dismissed. Uh, the person was charged at one point in time, so that uh, the victim still exists and and uh, would get notice. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Eric, can you speak to um, whether or not this language is? Uh, is needed, I guess, um, as a matter of statutory construction as opposed to, and then we can get to policy discussion, but in terms of, sure. yeah, thank you. Well, I don't think it's legally necessary. I don't think it, it changes. It's one of those situations where, you know, it often is the case with uh, legislation that sometimes the committee um, uh, puts language in for, for reasons of policy or reasons of, uh, uh, sort of emphasizing a point that may not be legally necessary, but sometimes you choose to include it anyway. Sometimes you don't. That's a policy choice. But no, I don't think that that whether that language is there or not um, is going to have any legal implication on whether or not uh, one victim gets notice or another victim gets notice. So that's not my reading of it. That it's a victim of the offense is, does not imply that uh, the person was convicted or that there was some sort of factual finding that the person uh, uh, had reached that level of finality in a criminal proceeding, by person I mean defendant. Uh, and that, um, you know, that phrase is used all the time, a person is charged with an offense, for example. Well, well established phrase that doesn't mean that the person was convicted. They can be charged with an offense, you could be convicted of it. Uh, it may mean that, it may not. Um, but I don't think it necessarily does. And uh, so in my view, the language isn't necessary, but at the same time, it doesn't hurt anything. So if uh, uh, the committee wants to include it for, for various reasons, it certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt anything either, so. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Martin. So, that was of my opinion. That was my opinion originally. Just the way that this language was put in there is, I think, very early on uh, when Representative Donahue uh, was uh, participating in in the in the hearings and such. Uh, this is one of the issues that uh, she raised, and then she proposed this language, uh, which we've put in here. Uh, at a meeting, I think last week around the fifteenth or thereabouts. Uh, or maybe it was the day before that, actually, uh, I suggested I didn't think it was really necessary looking at this language along the lines of what Eric is saying right now. Uh, and then uh, Representative Donahue subsequently sent me an email uh, explaining why she thought it was necessary. And that was posted so I can point you know, to people to hear the other argument for why she wants this. It was posted under Ann Donahue's name on uh, April 15th. Uh, I can, to save time, I can read just the last bit of it, uh, uh, Chair Grad, if that's okay. Um, uh, she says that it is more than just technical. I think we tend to blur the issue of whether someone has been convicted or not when the person has been committed for lack of competency or sanity. 
but that commitment does not indicate any finding of fact regarding the crime. I think this blurring enhances public perception that these are guilty people who are getting off with an insanity plea because the system we have is complex and currently very flawed in that we do not have an effective response for public safety purposes. This is not helpful in combating the stigma that wrongly associates mental illness in general with increased risk of dangerousness. So you can read that as well if you wanna study that a little bit further to decide where you all uh, stand. Um, I'm ambivalent because I don't, think it, I don't think it hurts. I don't think it helps. I don't think it causes a problem, uh, but I also don't think it's really necessary language either. I, I, I don't think there's a, that this is stigma causing because we're just relating this to the offense uh, really. Any event, so I just wanted to point that out so people are fully informed of what those arguments are in, in trying to decide where to fall on this issue. Okay, thank you, Martin. And, and, and again, Eric, it doesn't confuse anything to have it in there or have it out, right? I mean, it's really, no, I don't, really no, no impact either way. It's... I don't think in a legal sense, no. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So any questions on that language? Okay. So I realize we're getting close to time. I, um, I just want to identify uh, the other section that we have not. Um, made a decision on, um, which is regarding the language, regarding another um, uh, another evaluation, the language that's on page eight that was requested by the um, Attorney General's office. It's language that um, is in response to Vermont Supreme Court Sharo um, decision. And uh, what this language does is it goes back to um, what was the um, what was the practice before that that decision? And that decision was based on um, statutory interpretation that the the statute didn't um, didn't have the language in there. And so um, so that is J on page eight. And um, so that's something that we that we do need to decide um, as a committee. Um, I, for speaking for myself, do hope that we that we include that, um, and this is important to, uh, to the victims. Um, so I realize we've had a long day and folks may not wanna um, discuss it right now. Um, certainly if you have any questions for Eric, this is a good time. If not, um, we can certainly come, we will be obviously coming back to this bill, but uh, there's, believe it or not, there's not that much, I, don't, I think that's it <laughs> in terms of decision points. We've, we've done a lot of work here as well as the other committees. So questions, feedback? They're pretty quiet. Barbara, go ahead. So far, I'm. It sounds like a reasonable plan to me. Uh, I don't know. I'm. I don't have any burning uh, uh, questions or holes at the moment. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think what we'll do next time uh, is I think it'd be helpful to get a another walkthrough <laughs> um, of the bill. So. It all at all at once because we have been working um, on it in different sections and three different committees. Um, so I think it would be helpful to look at it, um, the proposed draft, uh, which. Uh, so Eric, help me when we put this language in that we just looked at. It will become five point one. Yes, that's right. Okay. So so Eric, if you could. If you could do that, please uh, incorporate the language, and then we'll we'll look at the look at the document in its entirety. We have agreed to to um, on a straw poll bring in the other committees 
work. But nonetheless, I think it's important to look at the bill in, in, in its entirety. Sure. And that's going to be mostly a clean copy? Clean as opposed to highlighting is, is what right. you're saying? or Yes. I and mean, we can highlight just this new new language. I was going to put my at. two cents in and ask for some highlighting. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm thinking, well, what, what are you thinking, Tom? Hi highlight from the Senate version? Or what, what are you thinking? I, I guess you... I guess kind of like what's highlighted in this 4.1 draft. Um, can we highlight the decision points? Because I know that that one part in section four is not highlighted but it's one of the three decision points that we have. Sure. It's the language that allows the prosecutor to also have an examination. You know, if we right. highlight those three decision points, maybe that's one way to do it. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. That, is that enough, Tom? Is I think so, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Ken? All right, thanks. So um, uh, Representative uh, Donahue and Morrissey were both involved in this. Are they happy with where this is going? I, I, I probably missed, I know you talked about it, but I'm just making sure I'm clear. Okay, well, um, Representative Morrissey is present on the phone. Um, Representative Donahue has been part of the um, you know, discussion so far, so I, my understanding is that she is um, is happy with um, you know where we are so um, thus far as an individual member as um, as well as a member of of um, House Health Care Committee. But Representative Morrissey, would you like to um, comment? I would just I would need to have the new draft and with the language in order to say whether I am or not because I don't have that language in front of me. Okay. Thank so you. if Evan could send if Evan could send me a copy, I'll read it over in the changes. That would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. And then um, thanks. And then the administration was heavy on this bill too, right? Are, are they involved with this now or are they backed off? Oh no, no. They've been, you know, through the Department of Health and no, they've been They've been involved in, um, sure, in, in these discussions. Um, and um, Representative Marcy, the sections that we're talking about now um, are not sections that your committee um, took a look at, but certainly we'll make sure that, that you have them. Um, there's, well, there isn't any proposal to change um, your committee's provisions. Um, we actually, um, by a straw poll, accepted accepted those those provisions, those sections. All right, that's fine. Thank you. And really um, with what we have um, really um, has been, with the exception of the, that one section uh, J where there's a disagreement between the Defender General's Office and the, um, and the Attorney General's Office, um, I believe everything else in here has been um, really um, agreed to by the stakeholders consensus. So, and that includes um, the administration, victims, prosecutors, uh, really, you know, all the stakeholders that we've heard from. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Not seeing any other hands. Um...